Making a support signs video on Hector marks my fourth revisit into the writing of Blazing Swords since this series began. It's funny. Fire Emblem 7 is such a character-driven game that every time I go back and read up on a character that is somehow involved in the plot, I've always been taken back about how much stuff is actually there to read into. Renault's backstory was tied up right with Nurgle, Nino had a really close affiliation with the antagonists of the game, and Elliewood's character development was deeply tied into the story and supports all at once. Speaking of Elliewood, in that support science I went over in detail about the importance of his fraternal friendship with Hector and finished off that section with how Elliewood contributed to his growth. Coming into another retread of Fire Emblem 7, this time with Hector as the main focus, I was actually unsure how I was going to approach him given that I thought I did enough in that video. I wound up finding more not just about Hector, but about Blazing Sword's other characters through how they interacted with him. He doesn't just have a strong friendship with Elliewood. The other characters, Uther, Oswin, and Ket this, Linus, all have important dynamics with Hector which contribute to him realizing his potential. Hector's journey is one of emotional maturity, of learning to overcome his personal fears and insecurities, and last but not least, to accept his duties as the heir to the Ostian throne. Unlike typical coming-of-age journeys that Fire Emblem protagonists tend to undergo, Hector's is coming to terms with who he is and what the world needs him to be. Hector's character development is literally nothing I have ever seen before in Fire Emblem, and even 15 years of Fire Emblem afterwards, no lord has had a similar journey. For the reasons I'm about to explain, Hector surpassed Elliewood for my favorite lord in the series, and I've never been more excited to explain why. There are two consistent personality traits of Hector's that appear throughout his supports which help give context to many of Hector's actions in Hector mode. Number one, his compassion for his friends, and two, his pride in his physical strength. He expresses concern over Elliewood's capability to carry on in his journey and references his own constitution to remind him he should be the one taking on all the laborious stuff since he is more qualified. Similarly, he expresses a concern over Florina's safety and makes moves to be closer to her to make sure she doesn't run or fly into any more trouble. In these two supports, he's compassionate towards his friends and uses his strength as an asset to help them out. He's not just some musclehead though. He has the emotional tact to help his friends through pretty tough trauma as well. In his and Sarah's A support, Hector finds out that Sarah was abandoned by her supposedly noble Etrurian parents and left in a worn down abbey in Ostia. Sarah begins to cry from distress claiming that she really hails from nobility and that the living situation was just temporary. Hector assures her that nobody thinks she's lying, but until she finds her parents, Oswin and himself will be her family and to come to them for help. Her insecurities apply to Hector on a personal level too because he also lost his parents and only has Uther left for family. Despite his carefree and boorish personality, whenever his friends need him, he's there. Hector prides himself highly in his personal strength and depends on that aspect of his character to identify himself. His supports with Farina and Lynn play into this idea. Both women use their physical prowess as a core part of their identity, just like him. Farina is a mercenary who only seems to care about money, since her past employers only care about her getting the job done. And if she fails or gets injured, well, so what? She's just a pawn in someone else's plan. Because of that mentality, she's completely thrown off guard from Hector's compassion and assumes he's just trying to get intimate with her. And in their A support, his willingness to help her up and guard her when she faints from exhaustion causes her more confusion. In comparison, Lynn takes offense to Hector's condescending attitude towards her capability as a fighter when he tells her he would rather not spar with her since he would be afraid to seriously harm her. Lynn takes it as an insult to her being a woman, but really Hector just doesn't think a light-footed sword fighter has a chance. Which doesn't really make her feel any less angry about it. Their support mainly revolves around this dynamic up until they actually fight and he wins. But in that A support, Hector reminds her that fighting isn't the most important thing on this journey and that she doesn't need to prove herself to him. As we can see in many of Hector's supports, he wants to be the pillar in any relationship. This is Hector's comfort zone, and that gets flipped on its head in his support with Oswin. In it, he expresses discomfort at the royal guardian power dynamic shared between the two. 
With Oswin assigned to protect Hector, Hector feels like he's just being a burden and that Oswin would rather not be here. But Oswin assures him that that's not the case, and Hector is able to express his gratitude for his support for once. Hector does not like it when he feels vulnerable. He's generally a nice guy and wants to use what he has to his friend's benefit, although sometimes he uses his strength for some not so nice reasons, like getting needlessly rough with Matthew to get back at him for trying to trick him into carrying his own stuff, or threatening his teachers not to tell Uther that he was off getting into brawls at the arena. So despite his compassion, he has a bad reputation around Lycia. This brunt and often standoffish attitude can tell us something else. Being so off-putting sometimes, a real rough and tough boy, he masks his insecurities, inner weaknesses that would prove he isn't so strong. It's a fear of his. If he appears weak, he will stop being the rock for his friends to lean on and will become a burden to them instead. Hector's character development is unorthodox. Traditional Fire Emblem lords usually develop over the course of the story through tough challenges, experiences, and decisions. But for Fire Emblem 7, most of these events mainly concern Eliwood. On top of that, Hector's hard nose and impulsive tendencies leave little room for self-reflection. That's not to say he isn't self-aware, because he is, but he's stubborn. Hector mode doesn't significantly change the events that occur in the main campaign, but instead it introduces new challenges for Hector to overcome. His personal growth hinges on his relationship with the other characters and his role as the brother and the successor of the Marquess Ostia and the leader of Lycia. Uther is Hector's older brother and is the current Marquess Ostia. He took the throne after their father died from a hereditary illness. In the story, Uther provides Eliwood with support, shelter, and guidance whenever he goes to Ostia. Uther is only physically present in either campaign for two chapters, so really he is a minor character in the story as a whole. What makes him important though has less to do with who he is and more to do with how his relationship with Hector affect his little brother's growth. After both of their parents died from illness, Uther became Hector's secondary father. Like you would expect from a caring dad and a rowdy teenage son, Uther gets on Hector's nerves. His older brother tries to keep him in check and make sure he's not getting into trouble, which annoys him. Uther has his hands full with being the Marquis of Ostia and the leader of the Lycian League, and not only that, but Uther faces the added pressure of being new to the throne. Constantly being tested for his temperament by foreign spies, Uther needs to keep a cool and collected demeanor. Every move Ostia makes needs to be thought out. Hector is the opposite. He's an immature, impulsive, and hot-headed lout, who, while savvy in Ostia's political history and the current events which concern Ostia and the rest of the Lycian League, actively stays out of his brother's business and does his own thing. Hector isn't a bit of a sticky situation. He knows he should be helping Uther, but he doesn't know how and doesn't like politics. To make matters worse, Uther is in an unfortunate position that if Hector did want to help, it would actually reflect poorly on Ostia. Hector, you're the Marquis's brother. Would not being at his side be seen as something wrong? The Marquess's brother is a well-known lout. If I were at court, they'd sense something wrong. You're not too proud of that reputation, are you? Not in the least. Uther needs to be the personification of strength and stability, but Hector's uncouth reputation precedes him. If Hector were at Uther's side, that in of itself might be a sign of weakness on Uther's leadership. Not only does Uther, Marquis Ostia need help, but he's getting it from Hector of all people? Yikes. For this reason among others, their relationship isn't strained when Hector leaves Uther for Eliwood. Uther gets it. He doesn't want Ostia to get involved in the foray situation, but he gets it. Despite the contention between the two, they still love each other, and that's just their dynamic. There's this really nice scene where the brothers speak privately after returning from Valor Isle. They express relief at seeing each other. Uther reminds Hector about who he needs to be for his friends, and Hector worries over his brother's health. Uther is sick, and despite his efforts to conceal his pain, Hector's worry for him grows. Hector presses Oswin for more information about Uther's condition. And several chapters after that, he expresses a kind of fear for him, now getting to the point where his emotions over Uther's condition are getting harder and harder to control. They're all the family either of them have, and they love each other very much. When Hector revisited Ostia to prepare for his fight against Nurgle, he wanted to check up on him. Oswin told him that he was traveling to Etruria for a conference, 
when the reality was that Uther had died. Later, Hector catches on to Oswin's lie. Furious, confused, and bereaved at Oswin for purposely keeping him in the dark about his brother's death, he begins to resent him. A day passes, and before they prepare for their final battle, Oswin explains to him that this is what Uther wanted all along. It was his final message. He is true to his own feelings. If asked to choose between his brother and the world, he would not hesitate in rushing to my side. Though he often speaks in anger, we are brothers. We are all we have. I have never doubted his affection. Yet what if the choice were between brother and friend? To choose one would mean abandoning the other. He would come to despise himself, whatever his choice. I cannot force him to make such a decision. Hector is taken aback by Oswin's message, but still isn't ready to accept what Uther or Oswin did. He distances himself from his grief and even keeps it a secret from Elliewood so as not to burden him. This fight is still Elliewood's to win, and so he will put on a strong face and continue protecting his friends. Uther and Hector are alike. Regardless of how severe their personal pain is, they hide it from those they love. Uther hid the severity of his illness from Hector so as not to worry him. Hector masks his sorrow with strength to not worry Elliewood. But there's another reason why Hector doesn't want his sadness on display. Hector has always had difficulty with managing his emotions in a proper way as his interactions with Lynn show. In chapter 18, Lynn's vivid and traumatic memories over the murder of her father and her tribespeople get called back from being surrounded by pirates on Fargus' ship. Hector walks in on her nearly in tears, and after Hector unintentionally provokes her, Lynn tells him scene by scene what happened the day her parents and tribes people were killed. Hector then turns his back. You're a strong woman, Lindis. I thought you would not want anyone to see you cry. You're such a fool. If you think that's what I want, then why not just leave? I... I lost my parents, too. You... It was illness that took them. Nothing like what happened to you. Still, I wanted nothing more than to cry like a little baby. And yet, I couldn't cry. Not in front of others. And when I was alone, I found I still couldn't. So, I simply thought, I don't know. You really are a fool. That's no way to... You can't just... Hector has never not been strong. Even as a little schoolboy, he valued strength and courage. He doesn't want to appear sad or vulnerable in front of others because that would hurt his pride and self-image. If people saw him as anything other than a reliable powerhouse, people will not view him as strong, and that he'll become a burden to them. As Hector displays here, he has no idea how to truly handle grief. He can't figure out why he couldn't cry by himself, and even years later, still can't. His only way to cope is either turning that sadness into anger, or just trying to ignore that sadness completely. Hector uses Uther and Oswin as a scapegoat for his feelings, because if he accepts that they wanted what's best for him, he won't be able to stay angry at them, and ignore his sadness anymore. For the first time since his parents died, he'll need to come to terms with his emotions, something he is unprepared for. In the final chapter, Elliewood sees what Hector is trying to do and like any best friend would, talks to him about it. Elliewood empathizes with his pain by sharing his own guilt and sadness over the loss of Elbert and Ninian, and tells him, if he continues to pretend that he doesn't understand that Uther and Oswin lied to him to protect him from himself, he'll lose sight of how much they cared for him. In light of Elliewood's intervention, he comes to terms with what Oswin and Uther had done. I never asked it of him, but even on the verge of death, he watched over me. However, Hector isn't the only one who comes to a new, greater understanding. It is also at this point that Lynn finally understands the depth of Hector's burdens and cries for him, because he can't cry for himself. 
His real emotions, his pride, and concern over becoming a burden are confronted and resolved. In the end, Hector emotionally matures by properly moving on from Uther's death, and he realizes that just because he shares his burden with his friends, they won't suddenly view him as some kind of distraction. He's still their champion of strength and stability. Hector is always going to be there for his friends, and he knows they're going to be there for him too. This is an important lesson for Hector to learn, but really, this is helpful for all of us. Sadness is hard to deal with. Sometimes it just takes ourselves to overcome in our own way, but sometimes one's not enough. If we know deep down that we need to reach out to those we trust to help, pride shouldn't be an obstacle preventing us from getting our happiness back. Because if it is, not only will we not be able to confront that pain, but we may hurt those who care most about us in the process. So far I've been discussing how Uther's death allowed Hector to realize he needs to let others in. So of course the story explores how his friends have an effect on him. In other words, Hector's growth here largely depends on how others help him overcome his challenges. The Elliewood Support Science explores how crucial his friends are to his development, specifically with Elliewood himself. In that video, I said Hector's personal journey is his struggle to accept that it's okay to feel weak. But the truth is, that's only half of it. The other lesson he learns is much different, yet perhaps even more important than what I just talked about. It's clear from what I talked about earlier that Hector is very loyal, compassionate, and protective of his friends. These are displayed in a few ways, like in his supports or story cutscenes between Elliewood, Lynn, Oswin, etc. And the other way it's shown is through adversity, whenever Hector's enemies pose a danger. The thing about Hector's compassion is that it's reserved for people he cares about and he has none for those who threaten him or his friends. Unlike Elliewood, who tries to see the best in everyone, Hector does not have any sympathy for his enemies, especially the Black Fang. Once the Black Fang really get in the picture, Hector's ferocity and scorn amp up. After Layla is killed and hung on display as a warning to Hector's party, he vows to destroy all the Black Fang ripped them apart with his bare hands for screwing with him and his homeland and his friends. He doesn't discriminate between Brendan Reed's Black Fang and Nurgle's henchmen. They're all the same as far as he's concerned. The Black Fang's responsible for the death of countless innocents. They're dancing on strings for Nurgle while he laughs in the shadows. Hector's loathing for Jafar is the most cold-hearted he gets in the game. He hates him so much for killing Layla, Elbert, and others that he charges at him with the full intention to fight and kill him. Then, when the party discusses following Nino and Jafar after they sneak out of town to see Sonya, Hector expresses contempt. Last, when Jafar is recruited, he warns him. <laughs> don't know how you feel about it, but I want you to know that I don't trust you. Every time I see your face, I want to smash it in. I'm not like the others, especially not Elliewood. He's soft-hearted, to a fault. He believes you, but if he says you're one of us, then that's that. <laughs> I've got one thing to say. You will not betray Elliewood. If you do anything even remotely suspicious for any reason whatsoever, I will cut you down where you stand. Remember that. Hmm. <sighs> While Elliewood and Lynn attempt to look past Jafar's crimes and try to sympathize with the collapse of the Black Fang, Hector does not. He sees them all as the same, and if it weren't for his friend stopping him, Hector would have tried to kill Jafar. He doesn't see the Black Fang as people with individual values and ideals. He sees them as the entity of evil. That is, until he kills Linus. You are a strong man. Under different circumstances, I think we'd... Do you regret the outcome of your actions? Greybeard. He only wanted to avenge his brother. I can't... Maybe it's regret. I'll carry it with me forever. When I'm alone and dying, what will I be thinking of? You're a powerful man. I doubt that such power will let you live a life of peace. Yet you should not fear. 
for perhaps that is the path of your life. The path of my life. That special dialogue occurs if Hector lands the killing blow against Linus in Cog of Destiny. For some reason, Linus, the mad dog, the most aggressive of the four fangs, causes Hector grief. Why? Comparing the two men, they are quite similar. Both are young and rowdy, both have brothers, and both express themselves, their compassion for their friends, and hatred for those who wish to harm them in the same way. What Hector comes to realize is that Linus isn't fighting for the Black Fang's cause. He's not just another lackey operating under Brendan Reed or Nurgle. No. You see, the Black Fang is dead, and Linus is here for his own cause. Vengeance for his brother. Linus was in a frenzy and viewed Hector as his mortal enemy, but Hector robbed him of his chance. For the first time, Hector sympathizes with an enemy and looks into himself in a way he's never done before. What if Uther was killed? Would he even care about Elliewood's cause anymore? Or would he go berserk, just like Linus did? He is overcome with sorrow and remorse of what he's just done, but there's more. He's overcome with fear. When I'm alone and dying, what will I be thinking of? Hector is not afraid of death itself. He's afraid of what kind of man he will be when he dies. Can he just keep behaving the way he does? Is the person he is now satisfying enough? Hector is starting to think he isn't. He realizes he cannot always be the young man who can run off on wild adventures with his childhood friend, and deep down he doesn't want that. He's afraid of the future. Will he have done all he could for his friends, his family, Ostia? His loyalty and compassion for his friends steers his incredible strength to protect them. He would rather be killed in battle protecting what he loves than dying alone. You're not dying while I'm around. <laughs> not a chance. Athos's words seem to reassure him that the power he possesses will bring his life fulfillment, that the path he chooses to walk will be the right one. Yet the advice is eerily somber. Athos is right. Hector will not live a life of peace. You desire strength. Then prepare yourself. Once you have gained such power, your life will not end in a comfortable bed. You will die on the battlefield, in the savage garden of war's bloody delights. I don't care. I will help my friend. That's why I've come this far. Armand, your power, lend it to me! And so Hector has cursed himself to die. Not next to his friends, not peacefully when he folds his hands and closes his eyes for the last time, but in a pool of his blood, all for the sake of ending someone else's fight. But he's okay with that. He wouldn't have it any other way. He's young. I'm young. You're young. Hector asks something that we've all already asked ourselves, or will ask eventually. Where will we be when we're about to die? Will we have been fulfilled? Will we be happy? Will we have done enough? Will we accomplish what we wanted to? The thoughts can be overwhelming, and they can be scary. But Athos reminds us that the path of our lives isn't paved by worrying about the future or dwelling on the past. It's made by what we do step by step, taking it one day at a time, appreciating what we have now and working towards what we desire. It's a bit like Hector always says, there's no sense worrying about it. The circumstances surrounding Hector Mode allows for him to develop himself in a way I'm not sure Fire Emblem has ever done before. On one side, you have his relationship with Uther and his friends, and how they shape his emotional maturity. On another, you have Linus, Durbin, and Athos, who get Hector thinking about even deeper existential issues. But what's even more thought-provoking is how Hector had to face these issues in the first place. These events occur towards the end of the game. Starting from Cog of Destiny, Hector confronts his mortality, his fate, Uther's death, ownership of Ostia, and emotional distress one after the other. As if to say Hector is growing up incredibly fast, right before our eyes. Oswin, this is for your ears alone. If something happens in Ostia, no matter what, I will return to my brother's side. I've been irresponsible 
and foolish in the past. But, as a Marquesa's brother, I will do anything required of me. I'm coming back. I'll take care of Nurgle and end his threat to the world. I'll be back. And I'll take the throne. I may not be nearly as dependable as you, brother. But, even so, together we'll make Ostia and all Lycia a place of peace. We'll put an end to peerage and make Ostia a place where all are equal. We'll try our best. Watch and see, brother. Everything that happens to Hector forces him to fundamentally reevaluate himself and change his ways to survive and remain happy. He doesn't get the chance to back out and run away and continue being that young deviant who gets into brawls anymore. There's one more lesson to learn here. There will be times in life when we don't have the choice but to accept responsibilities that we may not even be prepared to handle. Will we fail? Who knows. But the difference between someone strong and someone weak is that in those moments, one of them will give themselves a chance. Hector's gone his way, and I've gone both. So, the next time a moment like that happens, what will you do?